uh, first of all, I would like to clarify, like, are we supposed to finish it at 5, or do we get that? You still get 15. Oh, right. 5.15. Thank you. So one hour we get. Uh, you know, this has been a very interesting and uh, little confusing for me, because Dr. Ambedkar, Dr. Atul said that drugs are pleasurable. It gives you pleasure. And at the same time, our, another speaker from Sri Lanka said it is not necessarily always it gives you pleasure. So, but if at all it gives you pleasure, because that is what I heard while interacting with students at many forums, because I travel a lot, I speak to students, and the feedback that I am getting is that if you take drugs, I mean, they would say that, I mean, alcohol may taste bitter, but once you get that kick, as they call it, kick, then it is very pleasurable. So, now the biggest challenge here is to control that pleasure. How do we control that pleasure? That is the prevention. So that's a tough job which our panelists are going to do, talk about controlling or preventing the pleasure. So here we have three uh, experts, and uh, I would invite Mr. Rogers Cassirier, he's the Executive Director, Uganda Youth Development Link, to come on the rise. I would, the second speaker is uh, Ms. Mulka Nisic. She's the regional coordinator, Celebrate Recovery, Bora Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the third speaker is Mr. Subrata Biswas. So he's Special Excise Commissioner in Enforcement, West Bengal. It's a very interesting combination. The two are working with the community and in the community. And the third one is like a law enforcer. And a law enforcer talking about prevention is an interesting thing because he's working, working more on supply side rather than on demand reduction. But here he would like to like, you know, present on how important it is that both should go hand in hand. Uh, before we start, like, you know, just uh, as, as the panel, uh, the discussion is going to be on community action in empowering prevention and recovery, as we have been talking since morning that globally or earlier, not now, because the things are changing now, earlier it used to be thought that uh, drugs is always a criminal justice system problem. Now there is a shift, and now we have started realizing that it is a social justice system problem. It is not merely criminal justice system problem. So that is why, and when we talk about social justice system problem, so then the onus lies on us. If at all somebody gets, becomes a drug dependent, then it is our failure as the community members, as part of the social justice system. So that is where we are more accountable and responsible. And the best way is that everybody contributes to prevention and then the recovery. So I would like to introduce my first speaker here, Mr. Rogers. Cassirier. He has consulted with both local non-governmental organization and international agencies, including WHO, UNODC, ILO, UNFPA, and UNICEF in Uganda. His past research has focused on juvenile drug abuse and sexual risk behaviors and AIDS awareness among street children and slum youth in Kampala. He has participated in NIDA-supported collaborative research designed to adapt materials on substance use and run away youth to Uganda. He's, again, one of the Humphrey Fellows, Hubert Humphrey Fellow, and uh, he's chairperson of the East African Policy Alliance. Mr. Kasaria believes in early prevention. So I request him to come and uh, deliver. Um, thank you, my chairperson. I'm delighted, particularly for Diana, who sent me the invitation to take to the Indian Embassy for a visa. <laughs> it takes a while. <laughs> Many times people think coming to India is easier, but it, it takes a while. Again, I'm also grateful to WFAD, Mr. Esbion, Regina, for the support in traveling here. I'm a true ambassador of prevention, and I believe and I trust that if we are to take the road to prevention, we'll get a lot of mileage. As I speak, in 2005, Uganda was number one in drinking alcohol in the whole world. We drink more. We were drinking more. The, gov the country got shocked, but after 10 years, with support from friends like IOGT, 
and many organizations, drinking has gone down. 205, it was out of 10 people, three people were drinking. But as we speak, now six, out of 10 people, six people do not drink. So that is a very big achievement because of talking, because of prevention work. And if you want to stop, and if you want to prevent, I think let's spend more time with young people, with children. Let's begin with children. And as we talk, people get shy when they come to Kampala. They don't see people smoking on the street. We don't have a smoking epidemic. And that is part of the work we started some time back. And actually, if you are doing prevention, do not expect results now or today. Results take long, over 10 years. Vendor, the project you are doing, for 10 years you are going to have young people who will say no to drugs, who will say no to alcohol. And that will be a cycle. I think prevention also moves in a cycle. Moves in a cycle. You have to be very patient. And as you go along, many people will come and join you. Others even claim, but don't care. You work together. We work together. So I'm going to share briefly mm -hmm. what we have been doing in Uganda, particularly in Kampala. Our focus is like vendor. We deal with young people, 12 years to 24. We, we normally don't deal with adults, but we go in the community and do some community work to raise awareness. But I'm going to share with you briefly. I hope I'm going to handle it properly. You can see, previously, these were the most popular products. When they say in Uganda people drink more, you think they are drinking beer, bottled beer. No, they are drinking spirits. Small ones, very tiny ones, very tiny ones. That's what they are drinking. But I'm happy to tell you, but by beginning of this year, because of the work we have done, these things were abolished, were banned, and were eliminated. You could find young people hiding them here, taking them during lunch, the drivers, everybody. But government said, okay, much as we are getting money, we get rid of this, let's have the minimum of 250 meals. For us, this was a very big achievement. Now, I work with young people. These are the percentages. You can see that uh, many of the young people, 31% of the numbers I'm working with, present alcohol and drug abuse problems. So, which means you have also to deal to address drug abuse problem. This is the 205 report, how we were drinking and how things were really terribly bad, but things have improved. Now, um, the challenge we have, I don't know here in India or other countries, in Africa, the population is young. Majority of the population are below 30 years. That's why African government are grappling with unemployment, with high levels of crime. They cannot satisfy the young people. And actually, they are worried. The momentum, the youth bulge, the momentum is so high. Because if you have 40 million, but 78%, 80% are below 30 years. And you people, you are a decision maker, you are a policy maker. I want to tell you, it's a very big challenge. There is a problem of unemployment, there is a problem of trafficking, violence, crime. All those things are what? Are very, very common. And, and also fertility, you know, fertility. Fertility, we also have a big HIV problem, much as it has gone down, but again now it's going what? It's going back. So there are many issues which do what? Uh, which affect. I'm, I'm going to jump a little bit because my slides are many, but I'm leaving the, the slides through the website. You'll access the material. But what about the community, community action approach? We, where we want to raise the issue of well-being of the young people and the community. And when you go talk to the community, there are two things you are raising as a social worker, as, a, as an NGO, as a civil society. You are raising two things. You want young people to be healthy individuals away from the problems which come with addiction. Then the second thing, how do we ensure that in the community we have less violence, everybody feels safe, everybody feels that he can walk, he can sleep, he can have all this. And then how do we transform communities? And these are the two key things which we are aiming at, whether you are talking big or what. You want young people to be healthy, you want the community, individuals, to feel safe and, and to feel healthy. Now, the community approach helps you to work in that setting, in the, local tech, in the local context, where you work with the people to promote health, to pro putting health promotion very what? As number one. 
You are also improving the individuals and the community environments because together you come together and say, what can we do, what can we address? So the principle of community approach is about working together as one. How do we work together to help young people improve their health? How do we work together in our community to see that the, our people are safe and are living and are living well? So the key point is to take note of the issue of participation together, but participation by all community members. Then organizing people, organizing the people themselves in the community, leading by themselves and empowerment of the people through training and showing them that these things we can do. By the way, you don't need a lot of money to do these things. You need a commitment, you need individuals who are willing to work with you, and then you start moving. I want to tell you, other people will join you and work with you. Then we are talking of helping people to identify and analyze the problems themselves, sending them back to their communities, helping them to develop questionnaires, develop issues, and bring the issues on the table, and then they can be able to see the what? Then help them, after identifying and analyzing the problem they have, help them to develop strategies, community-led strategies. Those strategies developed in America, developed in Africa, but themselves at the local level. If these are the issues, if these are the problems, what do we do? Then um, help them to implement, help them to monitor, but also to evaluate, so that they can see themselves that they can be change agents. Themselves, they can what? They can help. We are grateful for the support, for the support which comes from many, sorry, the support which comes from many of our partners. Uh, we are a low income country, we depend a lot on, on many organizations at international level. And uh, we have done three, four outstanding projects. Currently we are doing a five year project supported by CIDA, from CIDA and IOGT. We are also doing one, we have done one supported by UNODC where we train the young people to work on international standards and themselves engage communities. Currently, we are also being supported by CADICA, Community Coalitions of America. How do you develop communities? And the communities themselves become the leading, and you, the NGO, you are standing at the back, help them to see things. So some of the things the young people and the community do is to collect data and also write the report themselves. Engage them in the policy and advocacy work. Peers, uh, peers, peers also uh, work on research questions and conduct studies, but also give them some basic knowledge, some basic information on concepts of prevention, but also how to refer their colleagues for support and outreach and outreach activity. Teach them how to design messages. They can design messages. Young people are knowledgeable and they are willing. And once they do this, then they love. They, the thing belongs to them. The activities belong to them. Community dialogues do street outreaches, school outreaches, drama shows, community, and you know, engage them in dialogues with the community leaders. And as you do that, information is going. But also, uh, the change is beginning to take what? To take place. Of course, the other things they have done, the follow, education, sports outreach, we do a lot of sports outreach and drama. Uh, what have we learned out of this? That when you engage the community, you reduce the burden. You are taking back the problem to them. You are saying we can work together, we can reduce this. And surprisingly, people will, people will listen, people will, will say, and even communities begin to contribute, begin to contribute. And uh, also, the other lesson we have learned is that all the communities are not the same. The communities will differ. So be able to recognize the inequalities, uh, but you need the community input, you need the community trust, you need to build the partnership, all those are very key. Give appropriate in information. And also intervention need to be supported by alternatives. The moment you say drugs will harm you, the moment you say don't use alcohol, don't smoke, you need to look at other alternative activities. Ask the community, ask the community, ask the community, it will, they will help you to show all that. Now, uh, these are some of the peer activities we've done. The young people, this was a project supported by UNODC, our friends Billy supported us. Uh, young people like music, dancing, don't forget dancing. Eh? Uh, peer education, peer education. Uh, these are some of the community summit activities we have done. Um, meeting with the local leader, educative, educative. Young people want to go in the community and give back. Um, 
sports, netball, football. We are not doing very well in football, but in Africa, no problem. Um, of course, training the NGOs and CBOs to work with you. Thank you for this. You had already warned me that I'm going to go on and on and on. <laughs> so, you know, it was very interesting. We are talking about prevention and recovery. So when we talk about recovery, as um, one of our friends was saying that in recovery, once you get, I mean, you can recover, you can leave drugs after the treatment, but not necessarily you're going to stay as you are because the chances of relapse is a lot <clears throat> because of the stigma attached. So that's why we say, like, when we call prevention, the prevention can be divided into two parts. One is the proactive prevention and the other is reactive prevention. The proactive prevention can be that the prevention, you know, we do to prevent the people from getting into drugs. And reactive prevention is once they are treated, then we ensure that they are prevented from getting back into the drugs or relapsing into drugs. So here we have the second speaker who talks, who is going to talk about that, like, you know, on the stigma attached with the drug dependence, the reason for like, you know, why the prevention and recovery is a challenge. So, uh, Ms. Mulkar Nisic holds a degree in political science, specializing in social work, besides having undertaken trainings in psychology, recovery from addiction, and drug policy. Since 2015, she has been working in the field of drug policy and recovery through the grassroots recovery organization in her home country, as well as in European Network for Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery through EURAD. Uh, Ms. Mulka carries different projects and research which aim to explore and improve the situation of people in recovery who are still struggling with addiction and facing multiple disadvantage experiences including substance use disorders, contact with the criminal justice system and mental health issues. I invite her to speak. Thank you. Hello everybody and I hope you're not too tired. It's a challenge to be part of the last panel for the day. But I'm going to try to be short, and I encourage our host, our chair, uh, to interrupt me. Uh, so uh, I want to talk today about uh, what community can do to facilitate or to block recovery, and what each one of us can do con to contribute to this process and to support long-term stable recovery. And I will also mention uh, uh, two of our projects. Uh, one is grassroots and the other one is a research project. So, uh, but the first thing I wanna talk about is what we mean by recovery, because recovery has been highly contested term from like the be beginning of it. And, but no matter what you choose to conceptualize it, I think that uh, the main issues are challenges that we face on the ground, and that is uh, transition from the pathology of addiction to a strength-based model. And what we mean by this is that uh, you make a list of all the alignments that are wrong and you tick one, one by one, uh, and it's not holistic enough for a person to succeed. And also, the other switch is uh, a challenge for professionals, and that is a transition from expert models to partnership models. And also, the third is the communi community, the, the, the high importance of communities and uh, the transition from clinical model to community-based solutions. And we always uh, mention this definition, uh, and this definition is, uh, done by Betty Ford Institute, which also highlights uh, that uh, voluntary maintained lifestyle must be characterized by sobriety, personal health, and citizenship to be called recovery. And this panel also recognized uh, that recovery takes time and that, it, that really uh, uh, can ach achieve uh, full sustainability after five years. So they divided it into stages, and uh, this was done because the risk uh, of relapse in the first year after the treatment uh, is 50 to 70 percent. But after five years, recovery tends to be uh, self-sustained, and it drops to 40 percent, which is also the percentage of general population that will ever experience any kind of problems with drugs and alcohol. And also, uh, 
there is a lot of discussions today uh, what to do with people in recovery. Are their uh, voices important or not? Well, I think they are because in America only there are 20, uh, 23 millions of people in recovery, which is like large group of people and their voices count because they need uh, effective reintegration and also there is evidence that 60% of people who engage into treatment can achieve full recovery. Uh, but what can we do as a society and as community-based or organization to support uh, someone for, for five years? So we need to, to look what is strong with the person rather than looking at what is wrong with the person. Uh, so we have this underlying model of recovery and first step is always to assess what are the acute problems and deal with like things uh, of ongoing needs and uh, crime, offending, using, but we also need to identify what are the strengths with uh, each one of the individual. And we, uh, uh, we need to build on those strengths. And we have like areas that uh, were divided into personal recovery capital, social recovery capital, but I also want to highlight that there is a community recovery capital, which is very important. And while a personal and social capital seem necessary for someone to initiate recovery, to sustain it, community plays a crucial uh, role. So a person has uh, all this person, like uh, self-esteem, like self-efficacy and support of uh, peers and parents. But what I want to add to this discussion is attitudes and perceptions of uh, the society and uh, the may maybe your region and my region. So uh, what do we link a person to when, when a person uh, completes the treatment, one year treatment or half of uh, year treatment? Uh, we need to link it into some uh, meaningful activities, as also Rogers was saying. We need to like build networks and partnerships in the community because we have all those resources in our communities. We just need to link people into those resources. And it's also, I want to I wanna also note that uh, recovery and pr prevention are very closely linked because it, it, there is a evidence that uh, prevention doesn't work if the prevalence of drug use is high in the society. So if we invest into recovery, we are also doing some part of prevention for successful prevention programs. But how do we do it if a public doesn't believe it? And uh, it's all about us in the society, me and you and every organization in the society, because public attitudes uh, are devastating. And we have done a research now uh, uh, of stigma of, uh, with people in, towards people in recovery. So we asked all these questions. Are you willing to uh, live beside people uh, in recovery? Would you let them look after your children? Would you uh, go into a relationship with people in recovery? And as you can see on this slide, the <laughs> results are devastating. And the prevalence of stigma and uh, negative attitudes undermine recovery. So uh, the main conclusion for our, from our study was that people don't believe recovery, that there is a transgenerational stigma of recovery because there were like majority of respondents said that even they would not let parents play with kids of people in recovery. So uh, addiction doesn't affect only individual, it, it affects family, it affects also a, a lot of workers. I am stigmatized for working with people uh, uh, with addiction problems and like social workers tell me why are you doing this? Why, why are you engaged with this population? Success rates are very, very low so you, you're not productive, you, you can be more successful in other areas. So we need to also add this to our conversation and we need to ask ourselves is addiction a reversible stain? And I, I'm going to mention two, two of our uh, really positive projects. And one is uh, supported in partnership with WFAD, and we are very proud of it. It's a, our regional Balkan project, project called Choose Recovery. So this is Balkans, and these are three countries. 
and we are not really a large population like here, but we are, try we are trying to succeed in this. Uh, so I, I'm also part of the larger network, and it's uh, called Recovered Users Network. So this network is um, a network of 59 organizations who believe in recovery, recovery organizations, and we try to advocate also for, for recovery on drug policy levels in UN and EU, and try to bring voices of lots of organizations and lots of people forward and feed in uh, the policy with our experiences and the importance of continuum of care and reintegration. So, and in my organization, this is our, our team style, and we have five volunteers. Our president is also in recovery, and we have one staff member now employed in our organization, and she is a person in recovery. So we have professionals, and we kind of want to encourage this kind of model, partnership model, and mixed experts with experience with professionals model. And we also have lots of partners, uh, universities, academics, researchers, drug prevention specialists, and we are also part, part of uh, very large networks and drug pol in drug policy field. And our project, Choose Recovery, has been done, uh, first we, di we did a needs assessment and we kind of assess what is needed in our community. And uh, as you can see here, there is a poor interest in this area of work, even in professionals. And we also uh, uh, saw that there are a lot of great services out there, but they are working in uh, isolation. It's not connected. People do not refer persons further into recovery. So we also saw the need uh, to engage with professionals and to, with, uh, uh, with um, media and to work on, on drug policy. And we uh, also have database of our services and uh, we did lots of researches. But what, what I want to show to you is that our substance use community centers, which have been established in all three countries, and we provide also online and uh, phone counseling, which is anonymous and free. So we saw that there is a, a lot of people contacting us that are very young, uh, in, from 18 to 29 years old. And what we also s have seen is that they uh, started using drugs very uh, at a young age. Uh, even 10% of them uh, have uh, like first used uh, earlier than 14 years. So we also um, uh, see the, saw the need of uh, early intervention programs, and we now offer multidimensional family therapy, which is uh, adapted to the need of young people. And we also saw that a uh, majority of our uh, service users are family members, and so we need to acknowledge the importance of families, because we do lots of prevention programs with children, but we always forget the family is where they come from, and the family needs to be more, need to be more aware of the consequences and risks and effects of, of drugs so they can be proactive with their children. But what also uh, is important here is that uh, current status of all 65% uh, of our users users of our services are not in treatment, and even almost 40% of them have never contacted any service. So we are kind of first stop in their life. So this builds to the uh, evidence that community-based organizations are very important in society, and that people and families like to contact uh, someone, someone out of the system, not institution, uh, to help, help them uh, with addiction problems. And uh, what I also want to add to this is our research, which is life and recovery research. And it was firstly done in US, in uh, Australia, in UK, in Canada, and also it has been done in our countries. And we uh, wanted to challenge stigma and marginalization with this research because we examined all five domains of life uh, uh, to see what are the differences from active addiction to uh, recovery. So how do people uh, recover is very different, but we uh, think that initiating and staying uh, abstinence is, is not the same. They are not the same mechanisms. But as you might have guessed, in addiction we have severe con 
consequences on the person, on uh, family violence, on employment, and on the economy. Uh, and in recovery, people are better than well. They volunteer more, they are uh, uh, remaining employed, they pay bills, they even plan for the future. And uh, that these percentages are maybe twofold higher than in general populations. So uh, contrary to the uh, public opinion research, this is a proof that you're better off having people in recovery in your community than living beside someone that has never used drugs because they volunteer more and they contribute actively to the community. I hope this is a self-explaining slide because this was not done by me. I shamelessly stolen this from Faces and Voices of Recovery and a famous researcher, Alexander Laudet, and uh, it proves uh, the economic benefit of long-term recovery. And they did all this calculation with economists, and they said that the cost of active addiction annually is uh, uh, 300, 350 billion on the economy of one country in healthcare costs, in productivity, social care, and also wider, wider economic. So what next? And I think that we can also discuss this more here uh, during these three days, and that's that we need to uh, challenge stigma ex exclusion and marginalization and to invest more in education, in jobs, and in housing, and in relationship. And also we need to inform our uh, drug policy and policy makers uh, about the experiences of people in recovery. And, and I want us to go with the idea that supporting recovery is not only for people to, go, to get better, it's rather to make the places we live better places to live. Thank you. I think the most challenging job is to be a moderator, to stop them or not to stop. So we have a third speaker here, Mr. Subrata Biswas, who is Special Excise Commissioner Enforcement, West Bengal. It's going to be a very interesting combination, you know. Um, he's a field worker, and he's a field worker in the sense like he's a law enforcer. And Mr. Subroto has worked as Zonal Director, Narcotics Control Bureau, which is the biggest organization of government of India uh, to, you know, uh, counter the supply. And the government of India from 2011 to 15, which exposed him to the complex web of drug trafficking and concomitant challenges across 13 provinces and union territories. He represented Narcotics Control Bureau in Indian delegations with Bangladesh and Bhutan on cross-border trafficking of contraband articles and in trilateral working group alongside Russian and US delegations on anti-narcotics issue in Afghanistan. He believes that demand control initiatives in the fight against drug abuse have been significantly neglected and the drug war cannot be won by supply control initiatives alone. So that's a very interesting perspective coming from a law enforcer. The Indian Academic Researchers Association honored him with a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019 for his anti-drug abuse awareness campaign amongst university students in West Bengal. So I invite him here to speak. Thanks. I stand committed to honoring the timeline. I won't take much time. I have just three slides, and I will uh, just present two issues in particular. The relative difficulty in addressing uh, a demand reduction vis-a-vis -vis supply reduction. And after that, I will try to present whatever little we have been able to do in our limited capability at the state level in West Bengal, along with the students of the colleges and universities. As it has been already discussed in uh, presentation after presentation, that the global statistics, it, 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 they present a very dismal picture vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, supply, um, um, supply issues, vis-a-vis uh, -vis demand issues. Caesars everywhere, especially related to drugs, Caesars everywhere point towards 10% success. So if we catch one consignment, it's safe to assume that at least nine have gone undetected. Indian scenario doesn't present any, picture, any different picture either. We have a lot of Caesars. Uh, uh, on a, on a pan-Indian scenario, 
Um, but 6% of global seizures that we are, I've quoted from UN OEC figures, 6% of global cannabis seizures were in India in 2016. And in 2017, 20% more seizures have been affected. But is it necessarily a cause for celebration? Yes, apparently it's a cause for celebration for supply uh, control agencies because that's a statement on our success. But if we, if we, if we, if we take into consideration the assumption of 90% going undetected, it's a cause for worry as well because we can safely assume a lot more is in circulation. And uh, even though you see report 2019 also is a big pointer, I, I, I won't go into the detail of all those. Uh, interestingly, in the last um, presentation, the last panel, the celebrated uh, doctor, uh, Dr. Uthul Ambedkar, he was lamenting that uh, health and welfare department happens to occupy apparently the most insignificant place in the policy coterie meant for formulating drug policies. It's, it's true, it's a sad state of affairs, but I would like to just um, enthuse it a little bit more with the, with the, with the, with the, with the reference to the political part of it. We, we believe this is a, this is a policy-making body. I'm not speaking as a law enforcement official so far as I'm making a reference to this side. It's an interesting uh, issue to study that everywhere the budgetary allocations are heavily lopsided in favor of supply control agencies. It's not uh, generous with the demand control agencies. I have a reference to I have the document with me. Many of you may be aware of this gentleman, John Ehrlichman. He was the assistant director of um, Drug Enforcement Administration in the, in, in, in the era of President Nixon in the US. After retirement and before he died in 1919, I think, in 1994, he had made a very candid confession in one of the most interesting interviews. He said that yes, in the late 60s in the US, we introduced tough narcotic laws. Narcotic laws are tough everywhere. It's popularly uh, criticized, highly criticized as draconian law. You have no bails. It's very easy to jail someone. Um, the prospect of getting released on bail is very bleak. So he said yes. We introduced staff narcotic laws, not really with a view to addressing the drug problem, as much as we were concerned about tackling the problem of the blacks and the immigrants and the communists who were troubling us in the late 60s in the US. And interestingly, those communities did have the drug issues. So we introduced tough narcotic laws so that we could, those people can be thrown into jails with little prospect for being enlarged on bail. Interestingly, this seems to be still ruling the roost in many drug policy uh, efforts at the, at, the, at the government level. When we, when we put more resource to the supply control agencies, the, su the supply control agencies means basically police agencies, be it excise, be it police. The, the, they are basically they are handling, they are administering the anti-drug laws. So when we enrich, uh, put more resources to our supply control agencies, that mechanism can be also used in tackling the typical non-drug cases. When we if you can incorporate, if, if you can include or import a drug angle to a case, the shorthand objectives become easier to uh, achieve for a drug, for a drug, I mean, for a supply control side, for a supply control agency like a police department. So that is why 
We think that the, 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 the political actors, they have more expectation, they have, they, have, uh, they, they have quicker returns from supply control. Unfortunately, the, the returns for demand control, they are not short-term returns. They are long-term objectives, long-term returns. Who, who unfortunately cares about the long-term returns? The political stakeholders, they are more concerned about the short-term returns, and the short-term returns are more easily achievable by the supply control agencies, not by the demand control agencies. So that is why the demand control agencies enjoy, continue to enjoy, a less significant position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the supply control agencies. Uh, in West Bengal, we have tried to make a, make a partnership with uh, National Service Scheme. I'm, I'm so glad to know that our honorable chairperson was, uh, in his earlier um, stint, was, he, he was instrumental in, 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 in NSS, National Service Scheme. It's the scheme involving the students, both at the school level and the college level. They are into all sort of social work, and it's the teachers and the principals who take the initiative in getting this done. So we, in the excise directorate in Calcutta, in West Bengal, we have tried to use this NSS forum as a sort of special utility vehicle in reaching out to the student populations and making them more and more aware about the abuse of ill effects of drug abuse. We have uh, uh, tried to dedicate at least two or three officials in every district in West Bengal who would be going over to, the, to these colleges and universities in association with the uh, NSS coordinators in colleges and universities. And uh, some of them are really forthcoming. Some of, some of the student uh, volunteers, they do uh, act as sort of an ambassador in their own community, in their, in their villages, in their neighborhoods, so that, so that a dual function can be served. One is they can address their immediate peers, the, 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 the fellow members, and at the same time, they can send a sort of an early alert, early alerts to the teachers. Some of the teachers are more dedicated, so uh, the, the teachers act as the in-house counselors for those affected children. And so in this way, the extended counseling is being done. Early alerts are being generated. And uh, we have a plan to, uh, and let me also share with you, for the, for the first time, uh, three years back, Government of West Bengal, in the Excise Directorate, which functions under the Department of Finance, government has here marked a, a, a certain amount, in the, a significant amount in the, in the budget, with a view to undertaking these publicity exercises in the student community, in the village community. Earlier, this was not so. This has been a recent addition, and this is a welcome addition, I, I, we believe. And uh, we have a plan to enter into larger partnerships. We, we as, a, as a directorate, we are a small entity, but the idea is to reach out to more and more uh, students, to more and more schools and colleges. Schools are not yet included in these NSS schemes, though NSS schemes officially are mandated for schools as well, but very few schools in West Bengal, they have NSS presence. But the colleges, they have the NSS presence. We have a plan to enter a partnership. In fact, we are uh, in talks with Rotary International. There are some uh, um, uh, interested uh, clubs uh, in, uh, within the Rotary community in West Bengal. So we have, a, we have a plan to enter a partnership with Rotary International. We have also a plan, in fact, we have also succeeded in uh, reaching out to some of the corporate groups so that a part of the CSR uh, fund can be utilized for these activities because it's necessary that uh, the counselors, the official, the, the, the uh, psychologists, the doctors, they are also required to be there. Whenever the, we have the early alerts, maybe a student is 
more vulnerable to such uh, fits. So that student has to be addressed, counseled, and that can only be done by the uh, experts, psychologists, psychiatrists, or the doctors. So for that, we need funds. Uh, we have already some funds allotted in our budget. We hope to have more funds in, in partnership with uh, CSR initiatives and also with Rotary International. So that's the project we are, have undertaken. And let us see how far we can go in this regard. We, I stand hopeful. Thank you.